I mean, I was born in <clears throat> in Bustleton, so you know, one of the guys I used to go to the Wadundi place up in in uh, Yells there, and and the guy said, "Well, you're a Wadundi man, you know, because I, I was born here." And you do, you take on, and you know, you do take on that sense of place. So there's probably an element of that in me coming back here. It always feels like home. It always has. I just feel creative when I'm here. It, it's hard to explain. It's the power of the ocean. It's the you now we've got a mixing of we've got forests, we've got ocean. It's just a lot of a beautiful, clean sky. You know, we don't you don't get that even in the city in Perth. You know, we don't have there's no we don't have many vehicles here. It's still a very unpopulated area. It's beautiful. You know, we've got between us there's there's an ocean for thousands and thousands of miles in front of us. Most of our weather comes from the south, though. It's this clean, crisp water that lands here and. Initially, Jeff Juniper to me was the essence of of that an early style. It was guys using what they had at their ha- at, their, at their at their fingertips, you know, like resources we had around us. Let's use that, use our artistic creativity to make it something that that's aesthetically appealing and usable, you know. Whether it might just be art, whether it's furniture, whether it's you know buildings. There's some incredibly good builders down here and, and building designers. So I, I can't, it's really hard for me to explain what the Margaret River style is, but I know it's there, you know. But yeah, I'm never, I was never really a business-minded person. I was more about just doing what I wanted to do um, and what I loved doing. So initially the business side of it, well, I wasn't, I'd never, I wasn't very good at it at all. And after being in business for about 12 months on my own, I was struggling <clears throat> to try and do everything, you know. So I could either employ someone and I had no money, so the best thing to do was bring on a partner. David come back from his world travels. Basically, he joined Jar Rock, as, so we made it a partnership. He was really, he's a really organised guy and great with figures and, you know, um, just likes to keep everything in its place and very methodical, total opposite to me, um, whereas I was creative and flighty and, you know, I'd go off and want to do things. And We're a perfect couple, you know, and I say couple. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've had a 27-year marriage now that's very successful. And one of the things I suppose when I started making furniture right from the, the start, even though I was inspired by Juniper and definitely my early work was led by his design and Robbie Malcolm, you know, but I was very conscious not to copy always, you know, I just, I always wanted to create something that was ours. And for a long time that made it difficult to sell the product because people just didn't get it, you know. Um, and some of the stuff I made that we took to LA was, you know, I look back on it now and it was actually really good work, but the market here wasn't ready for it. But there was that challenge in the early days of, of the market not accepting what we were doing. But, you know, we had to adjust to the market or, or starve, you know. So that's a definite challenge and it's a design challenge that, that we're constantly working on, you know. Um, but, you know, if it was easy, I suppose everybody would be doing it and the market would be flooded. <laughs> what do I think the market of style is? Um... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Basically what brought me here was the surf um, and being in an environment where I can go to a cafe and drink coffee and I really measure my life and my happiness in how many times I get to go to a cafe in a week. Both Rod and I recognise that the lifestyle down here enables us you know, to do what we do. And uh, so I guess that's partly the answer to the Margaret River style. It's, it's having the the headspace and the environment to let yourself, you know, relax into what you want to do and create. So EV Power is um, basically, Rod is an uh, electronics genius and um, he has, he, he started building his own electric vehicle and realised that if he wanted decent batteries that um, he'd have to invent a way to manage the, the cells because lithium batteries don't just, you can't just plug them in and use them. So lithium-ion batteries are very energy dense. They're a lot lighter than lead acid. You can use them any way up. What, what the, all the power that goes in also comes out, unlike their predecessors. Everything we do is, is changes every time. We, we do a circuit board like this, and we do a batch of, say, 15, and they change every time we do a batch of 15. Rod's EV power packs are lithium batteries, and they've got Rod's you know, value-added to that but by putting his battery management system on there and that is a product that's on his website and that goes out they have various sizes and they do a lot of applications but um, a lot of what Rod does is, is bespoke as well so that encompasses all sorts of diverse people there's it could be a busker in Perth who wants a portable battery pack for his busking to, uh, instrument or it might be a power company over east who needs to um, 
back up the grid because the grid is fluctuating, you know, the, the whole power grid. So we do a, a pallet load of batteries for that application. Rod designs all the circuit boards and uh, we assemble them here. Many hours on soldering iron and we've got an oven that we cook things in as well. Well, for me, it's always been about making the best possible board I can. For me, it was just um, wanting to get a really consistent product, something that you'd be, um, you know what you're selling because you've already ridden it or someone else has already ridden the product, you know, that, that model and that design, that rocker, that thickness and, uh, you know, it just gives you confidence in what you're selling. Well, it's a really a one-man show here. You know, I get two guys come in and do some glassing and sanding for me, but I've pretty much got to run the business, shape boards, deal with the customers. And do all that. And there was a time where I was selling boards to shops. I was selling boards to Japan and stuff like that. Oh, look, everyone that comes to Margaret River always comments on how easy going and happy everyone is in the town, you know. I think everyone is living that Margaret River lifestyle. People aren't really, I mean, I guess some people are going for the money, but a lot of people are looking for more lifestyle down here than, than chasing the big buck, I think. You know, like I said, I love dealing with the public. I love, love doing custom boards. and and now, you know, people are coming back. I, was, I had a, well, I lived on a property, uh, seven acres, and I had a shed there, and I was shaping from the shed. Um, we used to get, used to get a lot of boards cut from machine over east, and they were brought over in boxes for us. That's when we first started using machines. My mate and I came down from about 42 weekends in one year. Permanently, it was in the 90s sometime, I can't remember exactly, but yeah. I did work experience at school when I was about 13 or 14 and um, decided then I wanted to make surfboards as a living. I uh, left school straight away. I just started making boards at my mum and dad's place out in Nangara Pines. Started doing ding repairs at Murray Smith Surfboards and then one of the guys that was shaping went on to be a pro surfer and so I took his job as a shaper, started shaping when I was 16 years old and yeah, it just went from there. It's magic boards and if you get a magic board you can store it on the computer. I found a surfboard in the gym, I took it home and um, my dad took it to Murray Smith Surf Shop and he, he sort of cut it down, made it a bit smaller for me and just sort of started surfing from there on that old single thing. When I first started working here, I would, I'd be walking from here to the workshop about 20 times a day, and I'd be walking past Rod's car every day, and Rod's car is, as you know, is electric, and he's converted that in the past. And I literally, I'd stand, as I walked past the car, I'd scratch my head and just in disbelief, really, at the fact that he'd built this electric car. And so um, over the course of a few years, I, I, I realized I had to build a while I'm working for Rod and having that expertise at my, you know, somebody able to help me like that, um, I had to do it myself. So I built myself an electric car and I drive an electric car every day. Having, having built Rod's electric car and my electric car, um, this was really just something we had in the workshop that Rod used to, used to race as a petrol version. And uh, we figured that it might be something you could add to our product list if you could just have the controller and the motor and the batteries all as modular units that you could just um, you know put together in the workshop and then send out. We can uh, turn it on. And then based on the, the two electric cars, mine and Rod's, um, we got a commission to do a, a, a 
um, farm vehicle, which is really the same as our cars, but um, it's an evolution. And, uh, and based on that, we've now got this um, Mazda RX-8. Pretty uh, hot ship. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm responsible for building all the, doing all the fabrication. Um, Rod's really the electrics whiz. So I basically break, break the whole thing down into almost a, a straight line. You know, I, I look at the car and I go, right, where, the, where do I want the battery? Where's the level of the batteries in the back? And, um, and then that, that straight line dictates all the other things that come after it. So I, I basically start with what do I know? And what I know is by, by putting all the batteries in there, I know how high they are and where they're going to come. And I know that if I put that straight line in, that everything else will come after it. That, that's how I tackle it. I mean, I'm a purist. I, I want to make that car. I want to take everything out. That, that's, um, I want every single nut and bolt you can take out will make the car go a bit further. So. And that is, you know, that's the issue with electric cars at the moment is that we're only just in that time where this is possible, you know, to do it and compete with petrol cars. I think, and I always tell customers when they walk in here wanting a, an electric car that, you know, they should go and look at what's, what they can buy on the shelf for the similar money because, you know, if you want a bespoke car, it's not going to be, it's going to be, it's got to be a car you love but, and you need a, another reason for converting it, not just the fact you want an electric car. You've got to love the car. Because of the cost of converting, it's not a lot different to buying one off the shelf. So therefore, the future of this, this type of thing, converting electric cars, you know, it's, it's dubious as far as doing it on a large scale. I think doing a bespoke job on a car that you like, that's, that's where we're at right now. When young folks ask me, they say, how do you make a living as a designer and a maker? I think I always like to draw the analogy of with, if you're going to be sport and music, and, and like culture in any art form, they're practiced and loved across the widespread community in amateur and professional spheres of activity. But if you're going to be in a professional sphere of activity, you better be really good at it and you better find the market because just to hope that it's going to come to you, I think, is a bit of a dream. We established our business as a partnership with um, another glass artist um, and my skill set at that time was as a community artist but also I got very quickly experience with running small business and suddenly I found myself as a boss. So while I trained as an artist and a journalist, all of a sudden I was running a small business, I was boss to young trainees. There was uh, um, all sorts of responsibility. There was a lot of money business. There was days when you could get into the gallery and just spend time with the glass and what the place looked like. There was times when, uh, you know, we really had to nut out some hard stuff between us and the business has evolved over 24 years into different forms and into different... Styles. I mean, I've seen designs that I made 25 years ago are, are popular again. Now it's taste change. So it, it's a moving feast just when you think it's, you've got it, it's, it's, it's moved on again. What we've found is, is, is to speak with your own voice and have something unique to say, especially um, in your chosen material that you're working with or medium. This wasn't a traditional centre of excellence of glass making like Murano in Venice or, or other parts of the world where there's a thousand year tradition. People who work in those places are often weighed down by that tradition. Of, so we've, we've done things here in Australian glass where people have said, How did, why, did, why did you do it that way? And it's kind of like no one told us we couldn't. Whereas if you were in that centre of excellence where all of that tradition and history was, it's like, no, 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 that's not how you do that, you know. Improvisation, you know, mm -hmm. tied up with wire kind of way through to looking at new materials. Margaret River style is, is the pursuit of excellence and happiness. Perhaps. And I think also experiential. People yeah. being able to come here and go the next step. So to be able to eat the food, drink the wine, access the artist, the art, but then access yeah. the food, the, the food producer, access, you know, the, the market, access the, the winemakers at their cellar door, access the artists in their studio.